Live from the studios at the Thomas K. McKeon Center for Creativity, it's time for Tulsa's Creative Conversation, a show that focuses on Tulsa's local arts community. So let's get talking. Hello, and welcome to Creative Conversations. I'm Anina Collier, Dean and George Kaiser Family Foundation Endowed Chair of the Center for Creativity. And we are here today with Kip Rathke. Kip, welcome. Great to be here. And Kip is the Creative Director of Sesame Workshop. He's an Emmy Award winner. And Kip, you've worked with so many of the greats. Um, you've worked obviously with Sesame Street and Kermit Love. You've worked with the Muppets and Jim Henson. You created the Cat in the Hat puppet for Dr. Seuss. Uh, you've worked for Nickelodeon, Disney. You did Balthazar Bear. I mean, you have had a storied career. And we're so excited to have you here. And we just want to talk a little bit about kind of your your life and your work and we had um, we've we've talked to you about some of your your big words of wisdom and one of those is grab onto your obsessions and make them your inspiration and you've you've basically been obsessed with puppets your entire life and we have your first <laughs> puppet here so why don't you tell us about uh, your obsession and how you turned it into your inspiration I saw Sesame Street when I was five um, and I was a little old for it, for the actual educational part of it, but I just loved the puppets and w wanted to make things like that and make furry things that could come to life. And that was the very first season of Sesame Street yes. that you're talking about. 1969. Yeah. Yeah. And I also saw that and I wanted to live in New York. I wanted to go to that place. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, mm -hmm. but I wanted to go there. Yeah. <laughs> so... My path eventually took me to art school at Pratt in Brooklyn, and I started. I was always making puppets as a kid. Um, flash back a little bit. Um, this was like a puppet I did for when I was like twelve for a local um, puppet club that we performed at libraries around the, the area where we lived. And that was in Toronto, correct? Yeah, suburb yeah. of Toronto. And that's one of the earliest puppets that I made that still exists. A lot of them disappeared somewhere along mm -hmm. the way. But um, eventually I made it to art school and there were no puppet classes, but somebody said there was one a few years earlier and I hunted down the teacher and got hired to glue feathers on Big Bird. And who was that teacher? Um, Kermit Love, whose name Kermit was a coincidence. Um, Jim Henson had built his frog puppet out of his mother's coat decades earlier. Hmm. But um, it just, it was a more popular name back then, I guess. Yeah. Um, and Kermit Love was a costume designer for dance and puppet designer, and he worked with Don Celine, one of the main designers at Henson, and they helped Jim Henson sort of build his vision of this giant bird who was operated like this, and it was like a gi giant canary. And, and of course, we're talking about Big Bird. Big Bird, and so I got hired to, for the f summer after my first semester at Pratt, to, or first year at Pratt, to glue feathers on Big Bird. So there's like 3,000 feathers, and you have to sort of iron them flat and sort of with a little curl in them, and then glue them on, hot glue them on one at a time in a spiral up this sort of mesh body with boning in it. And so you spent hundreds and hundreds of hours yes. <laughs> during the summer yes. uh, gluing those feathers on. And one thing you've mentioned is that um, I think one of your parents said, hey, you could be making more than $5 an hour at McDonald's. Yeah, it was a long time ago. So yeah, yeah. $5 an hour was what I got paid for that first mm -hmm. summer. And yeah, and I said, well, but that's not the point. Right. Even though I'm making $5 an hour, this is, I knew it was the beginning of what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And that just being there, even though I was doing the lowest job on the totem pole, that I was sort of surrounded by really creative people who mm -hmm. I could learn from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, designers and fabricators and, you know, puppet builders. It, and it sort of set me off on my career path. And your career has really spanned everything from, you know, hand building puppets 
as I mentioned, you built um, the Cat in the Hat and many other characters that we all know from TV and the movies, and then to um, digital design, to branding elements and uh, rules, and now you're even into <laughs> theme park designs. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you transitioned and how you kind of just went with the opportunities that came to you. Yeah, so after, from Feathers, I went on to building puppets with three design, uh, puppet company that did um, Eureka's Castle. So I worked on that and the movie Little Monsters with Howie Mandel, we did the sort of puppety effects for that. Mm -hmm. We um, moved on to, or I moved on to work at the Henson Workshop on Muppet Treasure Island and Bear in the Big Blue House and Sesame Street and during that time, I was also doing some toy sculpting, and that led me to the next phase of my job where I went to Sesame Workshop, the producers of Sesame Street, and became an art director for toys and products and things that, and I handled the sort of three-dimensional look of those things. Yeah, and it's just neat to see the way your career has evolved, and now you're back to doing some physical puppets again, and it's it's neat to see how um, this passion that you had when you're a kid, you're still doing it just in different ways. And you come from a, a family of puppet builders. Your grandmother made puppets. Yeah, my great grandmother like got in the local paper in Toledo for um, just spending all of her time making dolls and clown dolls. We actually called her Grandma Clowny because <laughs> that's so cute. that's who I don't know. They thought we'd remember who she was if we had that image. Mm -hmm. um, and all of her, a lot of her daughters, my great aunts, just made hundreds of Christmas ornaments out of felt and all kinds of dolls and toys and things. So I was surrounded by that. Mm -hmm. And I think that sort of showed me that the craft. Yeah. And your dad, he was an artist, but he worked as an engineer. Yeah. I mean, I guess he grew up in the 40s and 50s and mm -hmm you just didn't become an artist. You know, he was, right. as a kid, he drew cartoons and invented his own mm -hmm. comic strips and and then basically the world made him become a chemical engineer. Mm -hmm. But because of that, I think he always really encouraged me to be an artist and to be creative and to do whatever I wanted. That's so. wonderful. Having a supportive parent really makes all the difference. Yeah. And so how did they how did they feel when you moved off to New York at age 18? I'm sure they were scared like any parents, mm -hmm. but you know, they were both very encouraging. My mom was also very creative and crafty mm -hmm. and I mean, they were amazing. And they, except for the part about, oh, you could be making more at McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> I think they were just very much behind me going to art school and sort of pursuing what I wanted to do. That's great. And you know, one of your takeaways was escape to where your life wants to happen. and. Why New York, and what what did living in New York mean to you? What opportunities did you have because you were there? I think it seemed like a place of energy mm -hmm. and a place where I could be who I wanted to be and do what I wanted to do. And also, I just liked the idea of it, just seeing it on Sesame Street when I was five, yeah. this, this sort of urban environment that I had never seen in the suburbs. You know, it was like, what is that place? I want to go there. And I don't, maybe I kind of thought there were puppets popping up everywhere yeah. when I would get there, but you know. In, in a sense, there were. <laughs> in a, in a way, there were. Um, another thing you like to say, make things you love and share the inspiration. Yeah, I think that um, I, even when I'm working at the more corporate aspects of my job, mm -hmm. I try to find things to do, whether I'm, even if it's making Christmas cookies, mm -hmm. you know, I spend three days a year making my Christmas cookies for my Christmas party. I love and that. And I, Halloween costumes. And Halloween costumes. And, you know, making the CEO's Halloween costume mm -hmm. is this great opportunity to get thrown back into like making things by hand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of these things, this guy was, 
I, I was the Wonder Twin, one of the Wonder Twins for Halloween about 15 years ago. And I, so I made Gleek the Space Monkey as a puppet that I kind of did on the side. And sadly, the foam that you build puppets out of doesn't last forever. And it's all decayed and completely turned to dust and fallen out. So he's only the fabric shell at this point, which is why it's kind of saggy. But, um, <laughs> And it's fun to actually sort of bring my early obsessions into some of the products that I work on at Sesame mm -hmm. Street. I, you know, I work with the theme parks and with their souvenir elements, so, or products. So I got to bring the Yip Yip Martian to life as a toy that people could buy, which is great because Sesame Place does limited edition things of very obscure old characters. Mm -hmm. And just to bring him to life as a puppet, you know, yip, 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 yip. <laughs> Nope, 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 I nope, think nope. those are one of people's favorites. I know, I know. I got to make it make it happen. And tell us about this guy here. And he's just a little gopher that I made by I I was playing with like my sleeve one day mm -hmm. and just sort of making it into a puppet and seeing how you can make the nose wiggle and the face and then I found a sleeve of a fabric that looked more like an animal than my own uh -huh. and chopped it off and then just started pinning it and making it into this little gopher character. That I love it. <laughs> so you can really like use your fingers and manipulate the face and get you know the movement and the performance with the nose and the little jowls and that. <laughs> yeah, it's so expressive and it's just a sleeve. I love that. Yeah. And you've done some puppeteering too. You you are not so much a puppeteer as you are a designer. Um, and you were, uh, tell us about the scene in Kermit and Miss Piggy's wedding. Way, way back when, um, they were shooting Muppets Take Manhattan and there was the big scene in the church where in the, mu I think it's in the context, it's the musical that they're enacting. So they're not really getting married, but Miss Piggy thinks they are. And they needed every puppeteer in New York to come to fill up this church set mm -hmm. with puppets. And every puppeteer had to do two characters. So they had the most Muppets. They pulled Muppets. Even though it was a Muppet show themed movie, it, they had Sesame Street characters in the back row. They had everything they could find in the warehouse. And I was Droop and the Flower Eating Monster, who are just some obscure characters from the old Muppet show they still had that w were kind of decaying like this a little bit at the time. <laughs> yeah. And so I did that. Um, Frank Oz was directing that scene. And we sort of lip synced along with, with the, the song. And I did get to ruin one entire take by swaying the wrong way during the song. So they <laughs> remembered me for that. But and it was at the end of puppeteering for you? Pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. <Yeah. laughs> like, I'm going to stick to building so I'm gonna, yeah, I like making things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, tell us a little bit uh, in the couple minutes we have left about the current work you've been doing with um, entertainment and theme parks all around the world. I, my job now, I am a creative director for toys. So I work with our toy licensees to sort of bring the characters, the, the, you know, the personalities of the characters and the look of the characters into the products and give them, you know, and help sort of keep the education, I work with our education and research team and our product development people and try to really get the essence of Sesame Street into the toys. Mm -hmm. And then I, now I also work on theme parks and live, you know, themed entertainment. So we try to do that with that too and really get the, get the show and get the, uh, you know, the personality of the show yeah. into the, everything we work on. You know, I, at Sesame Place is our sort of flagship theme park in Langhorne, Pennsylvania, but I also work uh, at Universal Studios Japan and Universal Studios um, Singapore, and we have rides and themed, mm -hmm. you know, attractions there so and that's also very sculptural so it's still sort of working in the uh, sort of sculptural media that I love. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing because you know you have this huge diversity in products and cultures but you still have to keep the brand in mind mm -hmm. and that's you know it's got to be a real balancing act. Yeah yeah it is. Um, 
That's why we have a great we have a great team of people, and we all work together to to do that. Yeah. Well, Kip, thank you so much. We've really enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you for sharing your puppet friends with us, and uh, we're really happy you were here. Great. Thanks a lot, Amy. Thank you. And that's it for today. We'll see you next time on Creative Conversations. Um, I remember.